Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sermon for Sunday, November 1st, 2015. Today, Pastor Bob Hiller brings us a message entitled, Name Calling, based on the reading from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1-3. through 3. Let's listen in. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our text today will be taken from 1 John on this All Saints Sunday. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, we give you thanks this day that you have called us to be your children. You have called us your children, for that is what we are. Help us this day, Lord, to learn the great joy that comes with such a name, but also the great responsibility. Have mercy on us for Jesus' sake. Amen. In 1943, a young girl named Flora, uh, excuse me, Flora Hillel, stood at a train station platform with her mother in Nice, France. Flora was Jewish. And on this day, her mother had brought her to this train station to give her away. She handed Flora off to a man in a long black coat, and this is the last time Flora ever saw her mother. The man in the long black coat put Flora onto a train that took her to a convent where she was brought in by some nuns to protect her from the Nazis. In order to keep her protected, they changed Flora's name from Flora Hillel to Miriam to make her sound more Gentile. Later, Flora recounts, they poured water on my head and told me I was a child of God, though I had no idea why. Now one night while Flora or Miriam was there in the convent, the nuns came into her room in quite a frenzy. They had to get all of the kids out of the convent. And they started packing up her stuff. And as they began to pack up her stuff, one of the nuns came across a pillow with her name, Flora, embroidered onto the pillow. The nun was terrified. If the Nazis found this, they would recognize her as being a young Jewish girl and they would take her away. And so the horrified nun began to remove the name from the pillow to undo the embroidery. And Flora lost her mind. This was her pillow. This was her name. This was a work of love that connected her to her mother. How from now on would anybody ever know her name? In her words, she said, I didn't know who I was. I had lost my name. I was meaningless. Later on, Flora, who became Miriam, was adopted and was once again given the name Flora. Flora Hogman is her name that she goes by to this day. I think this is a fascinating story. You can hear her whole story. It was on the radio a few weeks ago. If you're interested, it's just a fascinating thing to listen to. Uh, And I can give you the, the link to it. But I was just fascinated to hear what she was thinking as a young child when her name was removed from the pillow. She said, that was my name. Without it, I was meaningless. It's an interesting thing when it comes to names. Names give shape to the way we are. Receiving a name bestows identity and purpose. Our parents are generally typically the ones who give us our name and it fosters a relationship between us and our parents. We are known by our names. In our world right now, I think we can say there's probably two categories of people that we don't want naming each other. The first is babies. We don't want babies to name themselves because babies can't talk and it's very hard for them to make decisions like that. The other group of people we don't want giving names is celebrities, right? Because we all know celebrities can't seem to handle that sort of thing. We need only think of Michael Jackson who named his child Blanket. It's unique. It's interesting. It's a bad choice of name. Uh, names are given by someone we are in relationship with. Again, typically it's from the parents. Usually a name is given to connect the child to the family. I mean, historically, people receive names of their father or their grandfather or their grandmother or their great-grandmother to connect them to the family, to pass on a legacy, to create some unity there within the family. Nowadays, names are a little more different. Uh, They're given because they're beautiful and unique. Uh, Sometimes they have a very special meaning to the parents. The names are more individualized. Nonetheless, the name we receive helps create an identity for us. 
I remember growing up, my brother and I had our names we had little plaques in our room and it had our name on it and told us what the name meant. Um, mine said Robert and had a title there. What I've come to realize is now that I go by Bob, my name has a new meaning. It means he who sticks his face in a barrel to pull out an apple, which is a very interesting name to have. <laughs> This helps form and shape my identity, you see. Uh, at my house, one of the names I have is Dad. And this name that my children call me both gives me an identity, it defines my relationship with them, and then it gives me a purpose. It, it defines how I should be treating them, how I should be relating to them, and how they should be relating to me. This is the way names work. Now in the Bible, there's a great deal made about having a name. In fact, once you're baptized, we sung a lot about baptism this morning, once you're baptized, you receive a whole host of names from God. Over the past few weeks, we've been talking about what it means to be called, to be named a disciple. And we said a disciple is one who is saved by God's grace alone on account of Christ alone and is shaped by his word. See, it defines us. You are one who is saved and chosen by God. And then it gives us purpose. You are shaped to hear the word, to meditate on the word, to speak the word, and to act upon the word. It gives us identity and it gives us purpose. You are one who is chosen by God as a disciple to be a follower of Jesus. Well, as we come to our reading today, we learn about a different name that we've received from God. Because we have been baptized, God has granted us another name. And this is the name St. John tells us about today. He says this, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us. Lavished, it's a good word. That we should be called, say it with me, children of God. God has called you his child his sons and his daughters. This means you have a father in heaven. Remember the story of Flora Hogman here. When, when she was baptized there in the Catholic Church, though she had no idea why they were doing it, when she came out of the water, they said to her, now you are a child of God. This is true of you and true of me. When you were baptized, you became a child of God, born again. And God gave you his name. He placed his name on you. You were baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, marking you as His child, just as with our kids when they're born and we give them our last name, or when we adopt children and bring them into our family and they take our name, so it is with children who are baptized and people who are baptized. You now have God's name on you. You are a member of His family, and being a child of God, yes, gives you identity, and it gives you purpose. This is your identity as a child of God. You are one who lives in the ever-present forgiveness and love of your God and your Savior. You are one who has Jesus as a sacrifice, pleasing to your Father for all of your sins. You are one who has been lavished with the promises of forgiveness, life, and salvation. You have a Father who provides for you and protects you and looks after you and is ever-present with you. You are one who lives in the freedom of the Father's house. It's a beautiful thing. That is your identity. That is who you are, a child of the Father. And it gives you purpose because you have an end in mind, a goal, something you are living towards now as God's own child. You are moving towards eternity. This hope that John says, which purifies us. Listen to what he says. Dear friends, now we are children of God. Now I want you to, to focus in on that word now. You're not going to become children of God if you just do a little bit better and work a little bit harder. No. Now, by grace alone, you are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. You're children now, but there's more to come, you see. But we know that when he appears, that is when Jesus appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Our purpose then in life is to become like Jesus. Now we will never get there in this life because we have the old sinful nature and we're still going to be wrestling with sin, but our life is lived towards that. 
that when we rise again on the last day with all of the other saints, all of our brothers and sisters, all the other children of God, when we rise on the last day, God will raise us to be like Christ. Now that doesn't mean we're all going to be gods or something like this, but what it means is we will live as resurrected, perfected, deathless children of the Father for all of eternity, just like Christ. Because we have God's name given to us. This is our hope, and it's our hope, as John says, that purifies us. It's this hope that drives us to live lives that honor the name of our Father that was given to us in our baptism. Our lives are to be lived to give glory to God for His sake and for His name and not for our own. And this is kind of the hard part for us as children of God. Because as grateful as we are to be God's children, we must confess that to be a child of God means to lose our old identity. It means to have our old identity removed from us, and this can be very painful. Losing our, old identif- losing our old identity does not come easy. Think of Flora's pillow today. The name had to be removed by those nuns if Flora wanted to live. Now, it felt like death to her. It was, it was a removal from her old life. It was a removal from her mother. It was painful. But if the nuns hadn't graciously taken her name off of that pillow, she would be left for dead with the Nazis. The name had to change. And as painful as that was for Flora, it was absolutely necessary. This is true for us as well. Because as children of God, we've been called out of darkness and brought into God's marvelous light. And there's a thing that we find very comforting in the darkness. We actually like the way the world speaks to us. We like the things the world tells us. We like to hear what the world has to say to us. Sometimes we don't like to hear it. Uh, the world will tell us, you know, we are what we become. We are, uh, we are defined by our accomplishments and our works. And if we're accomplishing things and we're finding success, we feel great about that. And we have, you know, that name pride, proud person right there on our pillow. And we feel very good about that as we look at that name and feel proud of all we've accomplished. And the world says, yes, good for you. See, that's who you are, what you do. But then that hurts sometimes when we recognize that we're not always living up to what God says, that what we do is sinful. However, the world comes along and says, it's not your fault. See? You're merely a victim of your circumstances. You are perfect just the way you are. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to repent. You don't need to change. You are perfect just the way you are. But this, my friends, is a Halloween costume of an identity, right? Like if my son starts walking around believing he's Captain America, there's a problem. Because as it turns out, he's not really Captain America. Now last night he walks around, he dresses up like Captain America, and everyone rewards him for it. Good job, here's your candy. But he comes home, and guess what? The costume has to come off. And he has to look at himself in the mirror and (laughs) poor Timmy crying, I'm not Captain America. That didn't happen, but it would be really sad if it did. Uh, But here's the thing. For us, we walk around trying to prove how good we are, how great we are, and the world rewards us for this. The world says, yes, that's who you are. Your successes, your victories, that is who you are. And then we come home and look in the mirror, and the costume comes off, and we recognize, no, no. The world's wrong. I'm wrong. I'm a sinner, and I'm broken. And embroidered right there on the pillow is the name we deserve, Sinner. But this is why it's so marvelous to know that we are children of God. Because Jesus comes and he breaks the mirror. He grabs the pillow, which has some worldly name on it. And he rips the name out. And he takes your name and he... He carves it into the palm of his hand and he carries your name all the way to the cross. And he dies. Your Lord and your God dies with the name Chief of Sinners emblazoned onto his hands. He takes the name Guilty upon himself and dies as a sacrifice for you and for me. 
The blood is shed as the so named Lamb of God, the sacrifice for our sins, takes our sins, our pillow embroidered names away. But just like the nuns with Flora, he does so only to save us, only to give us a new hope, a new life, and as painful as it might be sometimes, a new identity. No longer bound for death and hell, you are a child of God, born again, named by the Father as his child. You and all who have been baptized into that name bear the name child of God. And with this comes one other name that we remember today as well. Children of God are also called saints, those who have been declared holy, those who have been set apart for God. And so we gather here as saints to remember the hope that is ours. That on the last day when Christ returns and we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is, we will join with all of our brothers and sisters in the faith, all of the saints around the throne of the Lamb. And with the angels singing with us, we will sing the praises of our God as we cry out, salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb. This is our hope. This is our hope that purifies us. That our Father and His Son, the Lamb, our brother, will receive our praises for all of eternity. It's this hope, it's this identity it gives us meaning in this world. It gives us purpose in this world. That is your meaning and your purpose, dear saints, for you are children of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, have mercy on us and grant us your grace. Teach us, Lord, to live in the hope that purifies us and drive us, Lord, to bear your name faithfully. Guide us according to your unfailing love. We thank you, Father, for calling us your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For more information on Faith Lutheran Church of Moore Park, California, and for more podcast episodes like this one, visit us on the web at www.faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.